We are back with another edition of the ML Ops Community Coffee Sessions. This is a special one today talking about, uh, it's another edition of what our friend Jet likes to call the Kung Fu's in the culture. We are joined by none other than Stephen Goldsworthy. And this conversation came up, the idea for this conversation actually came up because of a LinkedIn chat that we had, and it's kind of becoming a theme, a general theme to these coffee sessions where we have great conversations on LinkedIn. And then I just say, you know what, we got to bring this to a coffee session because these ideas are so deep and they're so important and we need to properly unravel them. And we need to look at them under a microscope and see if we can gain more insight from all of your experience that you've had, Stephen, and also help us navigate this uh, dark and lonely road, we could say. So it's a pleasure to have you here. Of course, I'm also joined by my man, Vishnu. Welcome to you both. Hello, hello. Hey, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here, guys. So I think we can start with just a bit of background about yourself and how you got into tech. Yeah, um, so I'm I'm now based in, in the Netherlands, just outside Amsterdam. I'm originally from the, the UK and I kind of got into tech um, through my, my degree course. So I studied uh, applied mathematics at university, went on and did a PhD in applied maths. And what always appealed to me was this, the fact that you could use the same techniques to look at multiple problems. So I jumped around in the PhD from looking at biological problems, uh, then moved a little bit into epidemiology for a while, uh, aerodynamics before entering more of the tech field. Um, I originally got going in the, the energy sector about, well, 10 years ago now, time flies, um, at, in a, a scale up environment in, in London and have stayed in sort of the energy tech sector since then um in a couple of different roles and for the last five years or so been based here in in amsterdam um yeah and you've you've seen quite a lot of transformation in that time mm. you know as i've taken those steps through from i mean i was a data scientist before it was called data scientist <laughs> um and we were sort of looking over to the west coast of the us to figure out okay what do we call this role what what is this uh, and then I've slowly sort of seen things come in a little bit more. And now, I mean, data science is such a broad spectrum of roles. I mean, it's a little yes. bit like, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years ago when we called everyone a programmer, you know, and it, they just did, did coding stuff. And now you kind of, you get all of the different flavors of software development and all of the infrastructure around that you're seeing uh, that sort of specialization coming in from, from data science with machine learning engineers, uh, ML ops engineering, AI uh, engineer into the analytics translator. So it's really seen quite a huge um, change there. And I've grown essentially from being a, an individual contributor into uh, a team lead. And ultimately the position I've had for the, the last few years has been um, on the board of directors of a, of a company. So it's a, uh, yeah, seeing things from all different angles. Nice roller coaster ride, I'm sure. Definitely. There's something that you said to me on LinkedIn that I found fascinating, and it was, <laughs> and it's it wasn't in any way tooting your own horn, but it was like I feel like I'm someone who gets it because of the background that you have. I imagine you understand the just implications that trying to do ML at scale and productionizing ML has. And so when you take up a new project, you have all of that experience with you. And so you are not so naive going into things. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I think my, my experiences come from particularly on that sort of combination of the, the algorithm side of stuff, that statistical mathematical thinking with the with the subject matter expertise and i've always been a little bit less on that real software engineering side of things so if you look back to that 
that data scientist Venn diagram that everyone was sharing well, five years ago now or so. I've, I've always been that sort of algorithm subject matter expertise. What, what I've seen is that I've been through all of those stages of working on a on a on a notebook, working on a on a problem, and what you want to do is you want to to prove that you've got a certain level of accuracy. You're solving a business problem, and then then what happens? Then you get to this um, notorious putting things in production. Um, what I've learned from the, the process of going through that is in production is is not the end. Um, I remember certainly. Uh, Probably three, four years ago, I was giving a lot of talks, and this was the the time that people were like, if, if you heard of a data scientist putting something in production, like this was really this was a real special event. And then we were, nice. from our experiences at QB, we were really sharing a lot of the knowledge we had of like, okay, guys, we've we've got we've got multiple models in production now. Really, there's a lot of other stuff that comes along that you now need to worry about. So that, that's sort of how I've, I've grown into this. I, my perspective has always been a little bit more on the, the, the technical side of stuff. So I, I have been in the trenches, so to speak, as being a data scientist. I know what it means to, well, to start with nothing, to start with data, to start with trying to understand the business problems and to get, to make that step from zero to one, which can sometimes be the most difficult thing. You've got, you've got a feeling of what might happen and you make that, that transition across. I certainly like to, well, I think I make good use of that experience in the, in the role that I have now, more of an executive uh, level role. Of, I can dive a few levels, deep, uh, levels deeper when needed. I mean, in, in the same way that good CTOs can dive into the code base and really get to the crux of the problem. I, I think you're seeing with um, data leaders that have that more technical background, they're able to they're able to jump in. They can appreciate the the technical challenges um, that that come from from doing machine learning at scale. And, and certainly, that's something that I've tried to keep a good balance between being a, a, enough hands on to understand the the current challenges because they change they change every every few months. Mm -hmm. um, but as well as uh, letting the letting the people in my teams have that space to grow and to take on those responsibilities themselves. Well, it's funny you mentioned these technical challenges. And one other thing that we talked about uh, prior to hitting record was the idea that the difficult parts aren't really the technology parts. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think I think you're talking in terms of those three real things you need to, to deal with in machine learning at, at scale. One, one, you've got the technology. Two, you've got the, the people component. And thirdly, you've got all of the processes that are required within an organization to actually to make the organization gel and to work as one. And the technology side of stuff, we're, we're very fortunate that we've got these companies that are extremely advanced with using uh, data and AI, so the, the Googles, Amazons, Ubers, Facebooks that have, they're a few years ahead and um, they've been able to uh, put the effort into building some technology that was when they faced the problem, they were, the, they were coming up to the cutting edge. They needed to create something. There was nothing off the shelf. Uh, companies that are wanting to work with AI now, there's, there's a lot of things to choose from. Um, you've got, I mean, cloud providers, they, they offer a lot of things that you can just, you can hook up and you can get quite a long way. I mean, things like uh, Kubernetes, I mean, that like if you didn't have that and you were having to build that from, from scratch every time, I mean, that would, that would uh, take a lot of development effort. So in that sense, I think that the technology, certainly in comparison to five years ago, that is, that is not the big stumbling point anymore. There's a lot of things that you can use um, sort of off the shelf. You can, you can partner up. I mean, QB in the last few years, we've been working closely with AWS and, and Databricks. So using some of that tooling. And that really helps a lot of just allowing the data scientists and engineers you have in the organization to focus on where they can really add the most value. And that is always going to be much closer to your specific use case, your specific business problems, rather than 
reinventing the wheel or even I mean, I have a background working in tech companies that there's in companies with a coach like that, you have very capable engineers and you know, those engineers, they could build those solutions and they know they could build those solutions. And a bit of them would really like to build those solutions, but you need to, you get that, that balance and you, you, you focus your efforts on where you can really make it is a difference to the, to the business. Yes. Yeah, I think it, I you know we we hear this as a recurring theme this organizational notion of ML ops and you know I know Demetrius has published some great blog posts that everyone should check out uh, about why ML ops is really an organizational problem and you know I think it's it's so fascinating to get your perspective as you said because you've really I guess you could call it matured through the entire process of of the I guess what we would call the data science career ladder and now you're at this interesting mm -hmm. executive position at an interesting moment where data science is really crossing crossing the chasm and, and is starting to become a part of business models um, a little bit more aggressively. Definitely. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think for so long you had sort of, sort of your typical organizational setup was to have the, the standard organization and then data science comes along in some kind of center of excellence or some kind of place where uh, data science, data engineering teams are trying to come up with uh, proof of concepts, something to prove the value to the business to then get the funding to take that to the next level. And you, you get with that, you get a certain amount of putting particularly data scientists on some kind of podium, on some kind of pedestal of, uh, of well, inflating the egos a little bit, but also needing to do that to build that momentum and to, to get that investment from the rest of the business. What I've seen is going through that stage. Once you've once you've made that investment, you've got a data science and engineering team on board. You've done those proof of concepts. You've taken some of those proof of concepts, put them into pilots. You've put them into production. You've demonstrated that there's value for the business. So you've already gone through that. You've got that sort of conveyor belt built and running, and you can you can bring on new use cases tackle new business problems and you've got a way of, of, of solving that, then what you see quite a lot is that then the, the challenges, they shift away from, as we said, shift away from technology uh, as the problem, a lot more into how do you, how do you organize that? How do you get data science as an integral part of the organization rather than just some kind of supplementary function that is yeah, adding minimal value. I mean, you often mm. see like the, the the stats of what eighty percent of of you, is it, I don't even know. I mean, it's, yeah, 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 models yeah. don't make eighty it plus production. models don't. We make talk it about it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> even the models that would have value if they were made into production. I mean, there's there's such a such a challenge of overcoming uh, overcoming that. So I think that the organizational challenges come from how do you embed AI as a core part of the organization. What I've seen in, in my experience, so the, the company I was working at uh, until recently, QB, we really started on having data science. Those first data science models were something like that were core product features. They weren't, they weren't focusing on sort of how do we uh, assist the CFO in making uh, predictions for, uh, for churn for the coming six months. They were really focusing on taking data that was coming from a, a smart thermostat product, running machine learning algorithms on that, and then offering those services back to those, those end users. So then you, you have to, in that essence, you have to get data scientists in particular very close and embedded within those product teams. So over time, we made that shift from uh, sort of a, a data science sort of innovation center, sort of center of excellence into a more of a, a data science and engineering uh, agile team, sort of one sort of team of a product owner into then ultimately taking individual or, or typically a, a couple of data scientists plus a data engineer and distributing them between different product teams. So you're you're getting those data scientists as close as possible to those business problems. And you've got the engineering support there to, to make sure that you can, you can tackle those challenges. That's a 
that's a tricky shift to make from an organizational perspective. You need to, you have to have a certain level of maturity across the organization. This is not only at the sort of executive level, you should, for sure you have to have the buy-in of the CEO. You need to have the, the COO, the CTO, whoever is going to support that understanding what AI is and why AI is different than software development. But you have to have the developers themselves, software developers across the business, understanding like, okay, if we're running some machine learning code in this in this next product, it could change. If if it if it gets retrained automatically on new data, the results that we're going to offer could be new. You need to have product management. They need to understand the, the trade-offs between things like precision and recall and what that means for the kind of service that they're offering. Um, as an example from, from QB, we were looking at uh, services of using uh, a thermostat data within a home to identify when people were, were present at home to alert them whether they should turn the heating off or not. You want to be, you want to be pretty accurate when you're making a recommendation there. And you'd prefer to have less recall, so less coverage in the population of your, your whole user base. But when you are making a recommendation, you want to be as certain as you can that that's, that's a true, um, that you're true. You, you don't want to be having um, other things coming in there. So you need to have a lot of education across the whole product team of okay. how to, how you need to change things to have AI and machine learning based in that product. Yeah, I, I I totally see what you're saying because the way that I I describe it, and I, I you know work at a medical device company as our as our listeners likely know verbatim, <laughs> and um, you know as we try to infuse machine learning into our product, it's so crucial that we understand the outputs of what other teams do, and really try and 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 emphasize to them how much we depend on them, you know, to actually get good data and to actually really make sure that our algorithms work in their context. Yeah, I think definitely the the quality of the data is something that's really important because you're, um, you, you've often sort of had this concept of like the data lake where just anyone can generate data and it gets thrown into the data lake and anyone else can use it. But then you, you soon realize that there's parts of an organization that are generating data. Someone else is consuming that in the organization, but it, particularly in larger organizations, you can you can have teams that are generating data and don't, they don't even realize it's being consumed and de- relied upon by another team. So I think mm-hmm. it's really important that you that, yeah you do have that communication. You do have that understanding of of how, of how that all works and links together. I think particularly for machine learning problems, a lot of the challenge is in collecting labeled data. If you want oh, yeah. to make a breakthrough in a in a machine learning problem, it's that labeled data that is going to set you apart. I mean, mm-hmm. because if, if you're comparing yourself to competitors in the space, I mean, everyone has access to the same technology. You're going to have competition for, for talent. But ultimately, if you've got if you've got high, top level talent, top level technology, what's going to make the difference is the access to the, to the data and particularly that labeled data. So making it clear and uh, letting the the whole of your organization and particularly the teams that are collecting that data be aware of the value, the immense value of collecting collecting data that can be used for labeling is is really important. I mean, our, uh, another example from from QB time we we were we offered a, a service ultimately that was detecting uh, using electricity data uh, inefficient uh, appliances within homes. Um, if we'd have just started off doing that, we would have not got anywhere, but we actually ran a, uh, a proof of concept, a, a pilot project with about, I think, 150, 200 uh, households that actually installed what's called a smart plug uh, with all of their, their major white good appliances. So the, the washing machine, the dishwasher, the refrigerator. So we could really see when those appliances were being used. So this was super important labeled data for the for the challenge of, uh, of identifying when those appliances were running. The initial scope of that, that pilot, we were looking at something to do with a demand side response, which is controlling switching devices on and off relative to a, a price signal. 
that that proved to be far too early for the for the domestic customers in in the uh, in the Netherlands. But the label data we collect really allowed us to make that step forwards into machine learning algorithms, particularly that shift from the, the very simple um, machine learning algorithms. Well, simple, but like the, the tr traditional sort of random forest approaches more into the, the deep learning approaches. That's where the, the label data pays back a uh, hundred, a thousand fold um, in comparison to some of those other approaches. I love how you talked about the idea of the center of excellence and how that's how it starts and it's like the gateway drug into ml <laughs> through that and you also mentioned something this is going back a little bit but you were talking about this idea of getting everyone on the same page and how important it is for every every stakeholder involved to understand the implications do you have a special way of doing that or what are some tricks that you found can help um yeah i i mean it's really important for different levels of stakeholder and what we found is that different approaches work best for some rather than others so what we at QB, we actually set up something that more like a like an internal data university we call it data Data Science 101. Um, so we, we set up and we essentially used examples from within the business to demonstrate a little bit of what was going on under the hood so people could understand what was what was happening. We offered that to everyone in the business. So all everyone from product development, finance, uh, admin, receptionist, HR, like everyone was able to access that and very enjoyable to dig beneath the sort of scrape beneath the surface. What we found there, there was really sort of three strands that needed a bit more attention. One was the sort of the product management side of stuff. And as I was talking about a little bit earlier, that's really understanding concepts like precision, recall, accuracy, what that means in the context of creating an AI product. Then you've got sort of the, the development side of stuff. You've got developers that are very happy to just take a little bit of sort of a, a toy example, take some code, some Python code, a bit of SQL, play around with it. They, they, they learn the best by getting really hands on very quickly. So we, we created a few notebooks that were able to be spun up by anyone in the organization and they could, they could play around with it. They could just, they could train a very simple ML model and they got a feeling for what that what that meant. And I think that the third bit is really more at that sort of executive leadership level. And that's when you're you're needing to understand the, the consequences of AI upon the strategy of the organization. And particularly the differences between what it means but to do AI in comparison to what it means just to do software development. Because I think what we've seen is, I mean, if you would look sort of 20 years ago, maybe even 25, 30 years, like when the internet was coming up, you've got like people feel, giving this feeling that, okay, the internet has a huge potential for changing everything we do. The, the companies that were able to, to adapt and make that shift to it, they're the ones that we see that are really leading the way now. I mean, I still re remember when Amazon.com just sold books. Um, you know, I mean, they, they've really been able to adapt to that. I think we're seeing a similar kind of step change with AI. I, I think if we look back at this in 10 years time, we're going to see that organizations that have across the board understood the implications of what it means to do AI embedded that within that strategy, those are the ones that are going to come out on top. So I think I like to make sort of that comparison to sort of the CTO role emerging 20 years ago when you needed, you were sort of shifting from that CIO role to so someone who had basically been there to sort out the, the computer systems and the hardware so everyone could could work on a computer back in the in the 80s and early 90s. So then the CTO role coming in a little bit more of like basically being the the tech the voice of tech in the boardroom so they could they could make that translation between technology and business 
and particularly the, the impact of the internet coming in. I think we're going to see a similar shift again with the, the impact of AI. I think there's a huge role for sort of the, the chief data officer or the, the I think the CTO has got a, a good role uh, in that as well. But I think we're going to need to see a basic level of understanding from, from any executive of what it means to work with AI. Um, and that's tricky. I mean, that's 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 really far outside of the comfort zone uh, of many of these executives. I mean, if you're coming in from a, a financial or operations background, I mean, you you know your stuff, and you're, you're very good at what you do. But to to make that to be able to understand the stuff that you need to know and the stuff that you can ignore is a tricky it's a tricky one to do because there's so much noise around the technology. There's so much focus and the conversation is uh, upon the, the the latest thing that's rolling out on AWS or Azure or this latest open source project that could disrupt everything. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, there, there's, yeah. there's a lot of techies in, the, in this field. They, they, they get excitement from that. They want to try out the latest thing. If you're coming in with the perspective of the, the CFO, you, you just want to know, okay, like, I, I don't need to... You need to yeah. abstract it a little bit more and get onto those strategic consequences rather than into the nitty gritty details. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 there was a lot in what you just said, and and it may, all of it was very, very useful. I really liked how you have broken down this whole process of data science education um, into different personas, right? That makes sense, mm -hmm. and and think about what those personas really need in order to be successful. I, I think that that is. Um, that's a very powerful lesson, uh, not just at, at, at QB, but, you know, for any organization that there are different personas and how they interact with this fundamental concept is, is important. A question that I have just to kind of level set, you know, it sounds like there was some really interesting work at, at QB going on. Can you give us a little bit of sense of like what your role was, what your uh, sort of mandate was um, and what how that fit into what your company was doing? I think that would be some yeah, it's good, good, definitely to give a little bit of a flavor. So, so QB as an organization was a, was a tech company around about the 150 uh, people mark. So uh, not not a, a small garage startup, not a massive uh, multinational, uh, sort of a mid-scale organization in that sense. My role in, in the, for the last couple of years has been uh, chief data and product officer. So I essentially grew into that role as the the focus of the organization shifted from hardware and developing hardware so uh, qb when i joined was very well known for creating a white labeled smart thermostat device that's been sold uh, across many european countries um, i think is around about half a million of those devices out in the field right now that shifted into sort of software services and then ultimately into data-driven software services. So my role uh, for the last couple of years has been that figure sort of in the boardroom alongside my counterparts from commercial finance operations of being that voice of data, product, and technology. And so the title was always a real tricky one to, to, to stick on because it's more than just what a chief data officer is doing in many organizations. It was really getting core into what the product means and the product strategy and ultimately the company strategy and making that, that transformation. So I, um, I led the whole, what we called the, the data guild. So that was all of the, the data scientists, data engineers, product owners, um, sort of BI analysts, were all sort of anyone who sort of had a sort of a data kind of flavor and was sort of sitting in that, that group and we worked closely together there. But also my responsibility was on uh, overseeing the, the strategy of the organization and particularly the, the interaction with our, with our customers. So the, we had a business model that was a, a B2B to B to C business model. So we were manufacturing a, a hardware a device, a smart thermostat and offering services on top of that. We were not offering that directly to, to domestic customers. We were always partnering up with a another a company, typically uh, an energy provider, a utility company. Um, so 
a lot of the the challenges we get uh, of bringing that to market is you want to, to utilize that energy utility to assist them in their transformation. They want to move away from selling electricity and gas into offering a service and they want to be able to, to, to shift and adapt their business model. But they are, yeah, large corporations. They come from a utility background where historically their role has been to to keep the lights on and to send a bill at the end of the month. You know, it's, 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 it's very different than working in a, a fast paced agile tech company. Right. So a lot of the, the stuff that we did there was actually working with those, with those partners and helping them to, to adapt to different ways of working, speeding up ways of working. What ultimately happened mm. is uh, a, a Dutch utility called uh, Aneco that had been our, our largest customer for a number of years and majority shareholder. Uh, we actually decided to integrate the, the QB operations, so the, the 150 uh, people from the tech company, into that larger utility. So a lot of my focus for the last 18 months has been on how do you make that work? How do, yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> how do you take these two different cultures and, and put them together and to get something that, that's ultimately strong? Um, that setup took, uh, formally uh, kicked off at the, the start of this year, early this year. And that's where I took a bit of a step back and I decided to, to, to let that organization sort of get up and running. And for me, it's, uh, I, I'm currently uh, exploring what my, my next challenge will be. No, that makes, makes perfect sense. I'm sure there'll be a lot of interesting, interesting things coming your way. And it's, it, it sounds like, you know, it sounds like QB had a, had a reasonably sophisticated business model, reasonably sophisticated product and, and things that you had to, um, you take into consideration as you as you went through an overall technology transformation, right? Mm-hmm. From hardware to software to data driven software, as you you know eloquently put it. I'm curious if you had to pick a project that really drove home for you the MLOps challenge, right? The organizational project, mm-hmm. you know, organizational challenge that we talk so much about. Can you tell us what that might be to the extent that you can disclose? Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to. Say- I mean, I think the best example is, is it's not the first project that we did sure. because the, the, sure. the first one, you're, everything's new. You, you always learn it. Like it always takes longer than you expect. I mean, I, I think our first project probably took 12 months from proof of concept towards getting things into production, but that's okay. because you need to build the entire data platform and ML infrastructure to offer that mm-hmm. first use case. And but the enthusiasm what, is always the highest at that point, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you start off, you've got, for the first time, you've you've got a, a use case, you've well, got a, a solution yeah. to it, and you can't wait to scale that up and to get mm-hmm. that feedback from your entire customer base to understand, mm-hmm. okay, have we really stumbled upon something that works, or how much does it need to evolve from where it currently is? Mm-hmm. I, I think when we really got a feeling for what it meant to work with ML Ops was a sort of, a, I, I guess we're talking this is probably like the fourth or fifth major use case that we were, were coming from. And we actually started from so all of the use cases up to that point were taking data coming in from this smart thermostat that was produced uh, in house. We were in control of collecting all of the data. We actually shifted over towards collecting data from a from a new source, so directly from a, a smart meter that's installed within a within a home. So this is distinct from a from a smart thermostat. This is something that is inst- uh, installed by the electrical utility and allows you to get access to electricity and gas data. What we were able to do then is we were really creating that product quite we didn't have so many of the constraints that were perhaps imposed from the rest of the the technology stack of the organization and we could really start things from build things from scratch and to integrate some of those pipelines coming in from a completely new data source with those existing pipelines and the the benefit comes from as i was saying earlier using labeled data from one source to uh, to supplement the the other that really highlighted, I think, for us the the speed that you can get if you if you have the right technology, the right, particularly the right ML platform in place. We were already up and running with 
we were leaning heavily on Databricks, uh, ML Flow, um, some of the Delta Lake uh, stuff that comes out of uh, them as well. And we were able to do something, I think, from the initial sort of proof of concept, which was what one of uh, our senior data scientists has kind of cooked up in a, in a notebook. I we basically, when we got sort of the, the go ahead, so let's get this in production, we were talking in terms of, I think three months later, we had an entire new technology that was up and running. And we were able to benchmark that against some some competitors mm, that's that were point. coming in from slightly different angles, and we were we were we were the best in uh, best in class. So that that really that brought home to me like when you've got the technology in place, when you've got a team that and uh, an organization that is gelling together, and you've got some you've got discipline in the processes you can move very quickly yes um i mean yeah processes i mean i remember starting off with uh, five years ago at qb and trying to introduce uh like stand-ups or any kind of any kind of agile process and there's, there's always this intrinsic pushback from data scientists particularly those mm. ones that are incredibly creative they they feel that this is like pulling them back. But as that sort of ticks on, as you get more and more into production, as it becomes a core part of business operations, these these sort of these rhythms help a lot. And you can uh, yeah, you have an advantage of a of a product owner, of an agile coach in in tweaking things and particularly the interaction across the organization. You 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 understand how these things benefit the the whole machine. You know, it's uh, yeah a little bit like I forget who mentioned it. Like pro, I've heard the quote before. Like process is like traffic lights. It may slow down an individual driver, but it makes the whole traffic across the city flow a lot more smoothly. So you very nice as you um, as you get away from the sort of this individual driver perspective into this sort of high level overview of the organization and what you can do to speed up the process really really help things yeah i mean i i just i love that you were able to communicate to us the value and the power of platform right because i think that is something that you know demetrius and i have seen and an incredible amount of energy and discussion around every company is really trying to invest in not just ML, but also what does an ML platform look like? How do we enable each professional at, as they, you know, fit into our ML strategy in the right way, whether it's through technology, whether it's through process, there's some great presentations at apply, uh, from DoorDash. Yeah. Um, you know, I think lemonade had some interesting, um, comments about this as well. Uh, so the power of platform, this concept is, is, is certainly something that we've seen a lot of energy in our community about. My question from, from that really interesting story is how did you communicate or did you to other, maybe other stakeholders in the business, you know, how effective this inf investment was? Like, how did you, how were you able to say to them, um, we just got, we just got our ROI guys. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's, it's a good question. Um, because that's, that's particularly that stage you were talking about earlier going from that sort of uh, sort of center of expertise into center of excellence into business operations as usual. Uh, we were very fortunate uh, at Q, sort of QB scale that the the biz, the use cases we were tackling first of all were direct product features. And due to our business model, we had a, a monthly subscription a business model, and we were able to increase that monthly subscription uh, fee that we were charging to our to our end users directly as we were bringing on these new services that were powered by machine learning so we could see immediately the the money that was flowing in that wouldn't have been there otherwise outstanding um that certainly helped a lot in justifying the investments that had been done to date you could demonstrate that incremental progress Certainly, if I contrast it with organizations that are perhaps using data science to, to make better predictions about the future, you can only 
know whether that was beneficial when you get to the future and they're able to look back on it. So you're maybe talking two, three years down the line. We were very fortunate in that sense of being able to, to demonstrate that we had we created services, they had value for our end users, they were willing to pay for them. We were getting, um, uh, we, were, we were quizzing our end users, like, do they like, does it bring value? Does it, does it really solve, solve your challenges? Uh, we were looking at things like uh, MPS measurements and uh, such like. And that allowed us to, to move quite quickly. Um, just before I joined QB five years ago, we were fortunate enough to have a CEO at that time who was really willing to make that investment in a data science team and a sort of head of product that believed in the power of data science as being allowing you to create things that, that that seemed impossible at the time, getting to those next levels of uh, energy saving or control of your heating system. So we had a lot of belief at that time. That's really what kicked things, kicked things off. But I'm pretty sure that if we hadn't have been able to demonstrate that, that end customer value sooner, the, the question marks would have come up because mm. I mean, we don't need to go into the numbers, but we were spending a significant amount of money on AWS uh, costs for, for collecting and hosting the data, as well as Databricks costs for spinning up clusters and processing. We're talking in terms of petabytes of IoT data. It's um, that costs money. So definitely needed to have strong support. I think it's important also, I think particularly from my perspective, it's that it's having that openness. It, it's sharing with, particularly with peers at the leadership level of, of what you anticipate the, the, the challenges are right now when you anticipate a sort of a further payback. Because you're always gonna, your first machine learning use case is always gonna cost a lot of money. You know, it's because you need to build everything to get get up and running. That's where it's going to take a lot of time. You're going to you're going to perhaps struggle a little bit with the, the enthusiasm. You, as you were mentioning earlier, like you start like the enthusiasm is like right at the peak. Um, yeah. When, when you when you start off there, I, I'm. It reminds me quite a lot of uh, when I did my PhD. Like you, I was told by uh, colleagues then, like you need to start at the beginning of that period with. It's such a high amount of enthusiasm that when you get like uh, like three years in and you hit that lowest of the lows, then you you want that's gonna what's gonna drag you through. Uh, I think uh, in the business context, it's nice having that that openness, that communication of just showing the value that automation can bring to the business. And I think that the fact that we were able to demonstrate like the first use case took what twelve months, the second we're probably talking in terms of uh, yeah, probably six months. We would now like by the time we're getting through to like the the tenth to fifteenth use case, we're talking in terms of smaller use cases. We've been able to kind of chop it up into smaller chunks, but offering new value every every sprint. So every two weeks, yeah, offering something new. So really mm -hmm. showing that incremental value, and I think that really helps to get the buy in. No, this is a it's, a, it's a remarkable success story for us to hear about how these things can pay off and how they can, you know, and how really showing that end user benefit is just so crucial to getting that the whole buy-in. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, what I found also is that going in the outside world and talking about it helps a lot, not hmm. only for getting the word out and sort of explaining explaining what you're doing and getting the buzz, but also getting your colleagues within the organization to 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 understand it, to be, become proud of it, particularly to shift that. Certainly when I joined the organization, it was very hardware focused. The, the company and my colleagues were very proud, quite rightly so, of creating a, a very good hardware product. But then you could see that 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 needed to evolve over time to, to them being proud of a of data-driven services to becoming proud of data-driven services that were originating from data, not coming from that smart thermostat product. You know, it's that that helps a lot. Uh, talking, sharing, sharing the lessons learned, getting a feeling within the organisation that 
yeah, you're, you're doing something that is breaking boundaries, that you're, that not every organization out there is being successful of AI. This is, this is a tricky problem to solve. And as an organization, we are doing, we're doing really good. We're in the, we're in the top 10, top 5% of companies out there that, that builds up the energy internally. And that's the kind of thing that you want your, your CEO to be telling the investors um, and just, you know, a lot of yeah. these, these sort of elevator chats or coffee machine conversations, that's the things you want to be uh, getting out. Hmm. So I'm wondering about this quote from uh, Luigi Petruno, who we had on a few weeks ago. And he was talking about how you can work on problems where you have these huge benefits and huge gains, but these problems translate to really relatively small benefits for the company as a whole because really you're working on the wrong problems and so you're you're focusing on this wrong problem where you're getting these huge gains but when you look at it from a position that's higher up then you see that well it's actually not the best use of our resources and energy and so from your standpoint being that you had more of a bird's eye view, how were you able to direct and how were you able to make sure that the problems that you were working on were the ones that were the biggest impact on the business? Yeah, that, that, that's always a huge challenge. I, I mean, I think the approach that we took that worked best is always keeping that sort of end user in mind, always being customer centric. Um, and if you're always looking at how can you add value to that end user, so for, for us at QB, that was typically uh, domestic homeowners that uh, were wanting to, to, to stay in control of their, their heating bills and to reduce their electricity consumption and to, to understand that. So if we took it from the context of trying to solve problems for them, that helps to simplify things because a lot of the time, the answer is, is not machine learning. I mean, probably 95% of the time, the answer is not machine learning, or it certainly shouldn't be the first thing you do. And I, for sure, I, I mean, I've been guilty of this in the past as well. You get so excited about the potential of what you could do with something that you you want to jump to, to show and, and do that. But a, a lot of the time, just, I, I mean, a very simple uh, model, uh, or a, a very simple data-driven approach can work very well or just a completely um, non-AI approach. So I, I think that helps a lot. Um, certainly having a strong uh, product management organization that are always uh, thinking in terms of the, the end user perspective, particularly the interaction with sort of uh, UX teams that are so in tune with thinking in terms from that end user customer perspective. Tying those together, um, but then being very clear of like, when do you need to take a, a strategic step away? Because as you were me mentioning, I mean, you can spend a lot of time focusing on problems that look like the main thing you should be solving. I mean, we could have a, a QB, for example, focused on making a, a much better model for detecting inefficient washing machines in a home. But at some point, you know, it, it, it gets good enough. You know, that, that's where we were looking away to, to new data sources, to, to partnering up, not just with utility companies, but with banks and insurance companies and spreading out in different uh, routes there. But always trying to keep that end customer sort of as a constant throughout. Uh, it's, it, it's tough to say, because obviously you're, you're addressing different personas of end customer as well. You're, everyone is individual. And you're having to try to make something that is uh, that is enough value that they're, they're willing to pay for it. Certainly, you, you see, I think this is a problem that the majority of companies struggle with is how do you prioritize the right initiatives? Because everyone is everyone's always looking at it from 
a, a limited perspective. No one truly has that helicopter view. Mm. Uh, even even from my experience, I mean, you you do get a more wider view, but you're certainly not seeing seeing everything. So you're having to be very sensitive there to uh, to the process. Uh, when, when I say process, you need to have a a good way of prioritizing initiatives across the organization, particularly when it comes to things, uh, particularly involving data science, where you've got a very limited pool of resource that you that you want to be maximizing um, its use. So you need to be flexible in how you how you deploy that across an organization. What it really comes down to is saying no to things. Yeah, it, it's always about saying no. That there's at a tech company, there's a hundred things you could do. There's ten things that would probably make sense for you to do, but you need to focus down on that top one, two, three things that are really going to make the difference. And I don't claim to have solved all of the all of the problems there. Certainly, that's. Uh, that's going to be something I, I imagine I will be continually learning on for the rest of my career. But it's mm. it's having that uh, it's having that confidence. It's learning from previous mistakes. It's saying no when you when you need to, and then doubling down on, on something that you know is 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 heading in the right direction. Excellent, Stephen. This has been a highly informational session. I thank you so much for coming on here and talking to us about it. Time just flew by. I was it really here. did. I mean, we were both taking <laughs> notes and getting all of this great information, trying to download as much as possible into our brains. Uh, it's really cool to hear this MLOps success story that you talked about. The idea of you're always going to trip and fall, especially on those first times that you're trying to use machine learning when you're in the business. So really have that... <laughs> that excitement up high so it can carry you through the the low periods and how to focus on the end user and how to get these metrics how to know what is going to make the the most impact where to say no how to define the different personas needed for your machine learning initiatives to succeed and and the processes that you talked about so I really thank you for coming on here. I want to extend, I hope that uh, if you're not in the Slack, you and everyone that's listening, if you're not in our community Slack, you jump in it because I'm sure a lot of people from this conversation will have some questions. If not, they can always reach out to you on LinkedIn, which will leave the description in the description, your your LinkedIn. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, please uh, reach out to me on, on Slack. I'm... I'm... I'm involved. I'm not an incredibly active member of the channel just yet, but I imagine that might change shortly. Nice. Um, I yeah, hope find it does. Me, uh, find me on LinkedIn or, or Twitter or Twitter as well. Excellent. Well, thank you again. And we, yeah, we hope to see you in Slack soon. This has been great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the opportunity. It's really nice to give that perspective from a uh, from that leadership perspective. And I hope we can. We'll be seeing more and more uh, people uh, joining the community in the in the coming months. Yeah, and I hope, like, that's really, uh, it's a great point that you say this, and I'm sure everybody stopped listening right now, but it is that leadership perspective, and hopefully more leaders can start to understand and see things, and I think that is what this session was really about, being able to see the different layers of the onion and help peel it back a little bit. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. many leaders are still getting their heads around what DevOps means. So um, yeah. Yeah, the surprise that yeah, the MLOps is, is, is coming in. Hopefully hopefully the, the, the mental shift required is, is minimal there. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Um, See you all later. Great. Thank, Thank you so much, guys. Hey, bye. Take care.